Well, today we start the chapter on proteins. The proteins and the topic of the next two chapters, enzymes and nucleic acids, I think of as information molecules and the ability to sequence proteins as well as nucleic acids, to sequence the uh, actual uh, order of their monomers, position by position. That's something that uh, has uh, revolutionized uh, biology, molecular biology at least, because of all the information that is contained in those sequences. In the case of the proteins, as we're going to see, the information is not just pure information, it is information in action, as it were. The sequence, the amino acid sequence of proteins, determines directly the shape of that protein and therefore its function. Because in protein biology, function follows shape. So we'll be talking a lot about the sequence of uh, both of these uh, classes, the proteins and the nucleic acids. There's a separate chapter on enzymes, which are simply a class of proteins, a functional class. Uh, but it's in a separate chapter because the enzymes are relatively so important uh, relative to the other proteins. So as I say, we'll be talking a lot about sequence uh, of uh, the proteins and the nucleic acids. The nucleic acids, we'll find, are all about information. Their function is to contain information. And what information am I talking about in these nucleic acids and proteins? All the information it takes to make a new individual for the next uh, generation. So every organism on Earth has contained in its nucleic acid structure, or sequence, and as a consequence in its uh, proteins, we'll see the two are directly related, uh, that information is all that's needed to be passed on in an egg cell and a spermatozoan to produce an entirely new individual for the next generation. So you can see the proteins and nucleic acids are truly central uh, to the function and uh, the processes of living things. So I'll start out uh, today with amino acids, which are the monomers of proteins. Amino acids are strung together in strings, just like the monosaccharides are strung together but uh, the monosaccharides strung together make polysaccharides. The amino acids strung together make what's known as proteins or peptides. So the ability to sequence the proteins, again, uh, made it possible to make a lot of hypotheses about how life started out in the first place. There are two general hypotheses, and I'm, uh, I'm afraid that many of the hypotheses I'll be talking about that pertain to the evolution of early life are untestable hypotheses. And so a lot of scientists would say they're not hypotheses at all, or it's very difficult to uh, test them. Uh, for one uh, reason, they happened a long time ago, and there's scant little evidence left of what actually happened, and in fact, the only real evidence we have of what happened, so to speak, is contained in those sequences of nucleic acids and proteins. Because, again, those sequences are the information that originally coded for the structure and function of the first living things, and still do. And that information has been passed down from generation to generation. It has been altered uh, stepwise uh, by mutation, basically, and by natural selection. But 
uh, basically the only real information that we have to base uh, uh, hypotheses on are, uh, is the sequence information. And I probably already mentioned it. One of the uh, pearls of wisdom in that sequence information that we have is that every living thing on the planet can trace its ancestry back to a common ancestor. Uh, other hypotheses are uh, have less uh, information to uh, support them. One is the prebiotic sooth hypothesis, which says that the way the Earth formed and uh, water was delivered to it, uh, and it finally cooled down enough that there was, at some point, a lot of water with a lot of molecules in it that could interact and start to evolve, if you will, uh, into the first organisms. So that's the prebiotic soup hy hypothesis, a sea of organic soup, in other words. You've probably heard that term uh, a lot. The other hypothesis, of the al an alternative, a popular al alternative, is the iron and sul sulfur world. In that, organic molecules were produced in those hydrothermal vents that are still at the bottom of trenches in the ocean. Those hydrothermal vents uh, are supporting ecosystems that don't use sunshine for energy, which is uh, not the case for the whole rest of the uh, biosphere. And instead, uh, there are uh, iron and sulfur compounds being ejected into the water down there through the thermal vents. And basically, all of that could be cooked into uh, a life form that didn't depend on uh, 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 reducing the organic molecules that are in this hypothesis, but rather uh, manipulate uh, these compounds in order to extract energy from them and to build up organic molecules that can eventually lead to life. Both of these are doing ultimately the same thing. They're extracting energy only from different classes of compounds and they're using that energy to evolve, to evolve into living things, to evolve metabolic pathways uh, and uh, uh, so on. So those are the two alternatives basically. Excuse me a minute, it looks like I need to Now, in the 50s, there was a famous uh, experiment by a graduate student. His name was Miller. He did something very simple. At, in the 50s, it, it, it was a, a matter of hot debate. Is it, is it really believable, plausible, that a sterile planet such as ours had to start out as being could spontaneously uh, generate living things. It, there was a lot of uh, debate about that. To many biochemists and, and biologists, it seemed simply implausible. And there was an alternative. Well, maybe the life form that uh, eventually gave rise to ourselves uh, was delivered to the Earth from outer space, on space rocks or something. This addressed the question of, is it plausible that it could have happened spontaneously without the panspermia uh, that they uh, talk about, that is to say, life being delivered from uh, uh, extraterrestrial areas. What a, a popular um, candidate for the extraterrestrial area uh, uh, that uh, would uh, inseminate, if you will, the uh, sterile Earth was Mars. And that's still a popular hypothesis. At any rate, Miller's experiment was simple. He had a closed system here that started out sterile. So he sterilized all of this glassware. He uh, put it together. He had a source of uh, water that mimicked the 
uh, ocean in the primitive earth, uh, he had a uh, chamber in which electrons would uh, discharge sparks across uh, the gap between them. And he had in the uh, system, he injected methane, ammonia, uh, hydrogen, uh, molecular hydrogen, the compounds that could be expected reasonably to be present in the sterile earth uh, before uh, life uh, began. And then he simply circulated the materials through that uh, so that he was simulating a, a plausible uh, type of earth conditions uh, that might have prevailed uh, before life was formed. And uh, here's the uh, source if you want to read the original uh, thing. Uh, here are some of the products that he was able to extract and uh, characterize from the soup that resulted from, I, I forget how long he ran it, something on the order of a week. Uh, and here we have carboxylic acids, a large number of those, succinic acids, pretty complex actually, nucleic acid bases. Adding, guanine, uh, these of course are not even in use, but cytosine and uracil, those are the four uh, bases required to make RNA, the modern RNA. And so uh, we had the components for that from the experiment. Look at the amino acids. We're, I'm going to, uh, we're going to see that there are 20 amino acids in common use today in living things, but we've got a large sampling of them just from this short uh, prebiotic experiment. So uh, he, um, this Miller experiment uh, convinced a lot of people that it is conceivable that a sterile planet like the Earth was to start it out with could spontaneously give rise uh, to life forms. And that's basically the, uh, the basis of all the expectations of xenobiologists who expect that sooner or later we will find life forms and probably life forms similar uh, to our own, similar at least in uh, uh, this uh, case, uh, uh, that we'll find them on other planets. And of course that's why uh, we are looking at uh, planets outside of uh, the solar system. There was a recent finding, uh, I believe it was at the Hubble uh, telescope, that uh, there is a system of seven planets orbiting a dwarf, a red dwarf uh, star uh, that could easily, uh, some of them could be uh, uh, capable of sustaining life. Again, all of that is uh, supported uh, by this experiment. <clears throat> now I've uh, I showed you this uh, slide before. This is the relative length of the periods of uh, geologic time uh, on Earth, starting with the formation of the Earth, its origin, about six and a half billion years ago, and going up to our own present age. And what I want to uh, uh, emphasize here is that way back here, more than three and a half billion years ago, it's hypothesized, and again, it's a hypothesis that wouldn't be easily tested, but it's hypothesized from, again, a sequence analysis of organisms that uh, are still alive, that there was a time when RNA was doing the work, the metabolic work, of uh, proteins and enzymes and that it was also the, uh, doing the work of DNA. It was also the genetic uh, material. So in other words, one class of um, uh, uh, compounds, ribonucleic acids, was performing basically all of the functions of, uh, that would be required by early living things, with the notable exception of those lipid bilayer cell membranes that I already talked about. This RNA world eventually gave rise 
to a world in which the a lot of the catalytic activity uh, is performed by enzymes, which are proteins, and a lot of the genetic functions, that is to say the passage of sequence information from one generation to the next, that's uh, now largely done by DNA, not RNA. But it turns out that our uh, cell machinery is full of uh, uh, little machines that include pieces of RNA uh, in them, spliceosomes, the ribosomes that we'll talk about in detail, and so on. So the RNA is still in use as a catalyst and as a, a structural a component uh, to this day, and it, it's thought to be a realm of the RNA world. Because, frankly, anything that the RNA can and does do could be done uh, by proteins and uh, DNA. Anyway, as you see, there's a long period, several billion years, before uh, creatures such as ourselves uh, are uh, evolved on Earth. There's a thing uh, 50 million years ago. There, uh, about 543 million years ago, half a billion years ago, there's a thing called the Cambrian Explosion. That uh, seems to have uh, been uh, caused by or uh, followed a large proliferation of the types of proteins that regulate the expression of genes so that multicellular complex organisms uh, were possible. Before that, uh, they, uh, they were uh, very simple organisms uh, by comparison. And again, that's only half a billion years out of the four and a half billion years that the, is a hypothesis that the Earth has been around. The LUCA here uh, stands for the last universal cellular ancestor. And what they're talking about here is that for the early evolution of these organisms, there was probably a lot of diversity, but at some point, probably with protein and DNA came to be used uh, in a line of them, that line gave rise to uh, the uh, Huka, and everything that's alive on Earth now is uh, descended from that. Uh, last universal uh, cellular ancestor. So that's the backdrop for the evolution both of the nucleic acids and the evolution of nucleic acids is driven by random mutations that happen all the time, can't be avoided, and in fact uh, without these random mutations evolution would cease. But the mutations in DNA are not uh, do not impact the organisms they uh, occur in uh, unless uh, the mutation causes the change in the amino acid sequence of these proteins. And so that's the way the information flows from the DNA to the uh, uh, proteins. The proteins are what actually cause the phenotypes, uh, which is, say, every observable uh, uh, facet of that organism uh, is traceable basically to the proteins that are in its cell. And those proteins, in turn, their sequence, their uh, structure and function, uh, is determined by the sequence of the uh, nucleic acids. So it's all of a, uh, of a piece uh, that these the evolution of proteins are driving the evolution of the biosphere in general. To talk about the proteins, we first have to talk about their monomers. There are 20 different monomers called uh, amino acids. They're the building blocks of proteins. Each one has a carboxylic acid group and an amino group, which is why they're called amino acids. There's an alpha carbon in each of them that the amino group and carboxylic acid group 
are uh, directly bonded to. There is also, uh, bonded to the alpha carbon, a hydrogen. So you see the hydrogen. Here's the alpha carbon. Here's the space. Hydrogen. That uh, leaves one group, uh, or uh, one bond left. And what's bound to that fourth bond to, of the alpha carbon is called the R group, the residue, uh, or the side chain, it's also known as. And what it is, is some group, some organic uh, uh, substituent, if you will, of which there are 20 different types. So the R that you see here rep uh, can stand for uh, any one of 20 different residues or R groups. So there are 20 common amino acids found in proteins, and each is determined by one of these unique R groups. So again, you have an alpha carbon, you have an amino group, and a carboxylic acid group bound to it. There's a hydrogen uh, bound to it as well, and then some kind of uh, an R group, in this case, a methyl group, which means this is the amino acid alanine. That's the name for the uh, amino acid that has a methyl group for its R group. Now these amino acids, because of their structure, can ionize. Uh, the, at uh, pH 7.4, basically the physiological pH, amino acids uh, are ionized, in fact. The carboxylic acid group donates a hydrogen to the amino group. So you get a carboxylate, that's what we have here, and an ammonium group on this uh, amino acid. Well, that means that this amino acid altogether has both a negative charge on it and a positive charge. Uh, a molecule like that is known as a zwitter ion. So amino acids, again, if they're at physiological pH, they're going to have a negative charge on the carboxylate group and a positive charge on the ammonium group. So, uh, uh, so we start out again with alanine and we have the uh, corresponding zwitter ion. Amino acids are classified according to their uh, R groups. The R groups in amino acids are 20 different uh, unique groups. Each of the groups has different uh, polar or nonpolar characters, uh, acidic characters or base characters, and so on. So they can be classified this way. There are the nonpolar ones. They're hydrophobic, of course. There are polar neutral ones. They uh, uh, have polar bonds because there's an O or a, an oxygen or a sulfur uh, on them. Uh, uh, but they uh, are not ionized. They're not charged. So they are hydrophilic because of these polar bonds uh, in them. There are also, also uh, amino acids that are polar and acidic as well. They have carboxyl groups, and again, the carboxyl groups are going to be at pH 7.4 negatively charged. They're going to be carboxylate uh, ions, if you will. Uh, so they're going to be hydrophilic as well by virtue of uh, the uh, charge on them. Finally, there are polar groups that are basic. They have amino groups that become ammonium ions at pH 7.4. So, again, that makes them hydrophilic as well. So you can group the amino acids into these uh, four types, and the four types are going to interact uh, with one another in different ways. And we're going to find that the structure, and therefore the uh, function of a protein, is largely determined by interactions between uh, uh, amino acids. And part of the interactions are going to be the result of their particular classification here. So uh, nonpolar here, again, this is an R group that is uh, uh, nonpolar, the methyl group of alanine. There are also uh, R groups that are aromatic. 
or simply hydrocarbons. All of those are going to be nonpolar and hydrophobic, of course. Here's the polar neutral of uh, the example here is serine. You have a polar bond here between the oxygen and hydrogen, but you don't have an overall charge on it. The positive charge here uh, uh, negates the negative charge there. There are polar acidic groups. Here's the carboxylate group. Again, this car uh, carboxylic acid group is going to donate a hydrogen to water, making the amino acid uh, acidic. Uh, finally, there's a basic group. Uh, it contains uh, uh, the uh, amino group that is going to, at pH 7.4, uh, be positively charged, an ammonium uh, cation. Let's see. That covers all of that. So here's a list of all the nonpolar uh, amino acids glycine, alanine, valine, leucine, isoleucine, phenylalanine, uh, uh, this is uh, methionine, proline, and tryptophan. All of these, as you see, are either alkyl uh, side chains or R groups, or they're aromatic R groups. That uh, will make them hydrophobic. Now, the nonpolar amino acids, because they're hydrophobic, have a special uh, function in uh, protein structure function. Being hydrophobic, they are going to interact with one another more than they're going to interact with the water molecules that generally will surround whatever protein they are part of. That means that they're going to dive for the core of the protein to get away from the aqueous environment. When they do that, they're going to cause the protein to assume some uh, folding conformation that it otherwise wouldn't. It's called hydrophobic interactions, and hydrophobic interactions are a strong determinant of uh, uh, important factors in the final structure function of uh, protein. Uh, what else Polar amino acid has an R group that's either alcohol thiol or uh, amine, that is to say a neutral one. So uh, here we have serine, threonine, tyrosine, cysteine, asparagine, and glutamine. What we see on all of these is that there is a uh, hydroxyl group here, one here and here, the thiol group. If you recall what thiols are, uh, they're leading to the cysteine amino acid. Uh, thiol group is also polar, uh, but uh, all of these are neutral. Uh, here we have asparagine. This is the polar part of it, but it's neutral. And uh, the uh, uh, glutamine. These, this is, these are both amide groups. So our groups can contain, uh, of the uh, neutral uh, polar amino acids, they contain hydroxyls, they can contain thiols, or they can contain uh, amide groups. If this was, if these were amino groups, then you would not have a neutral one because this would uh, take up a hydrogen and pr uh, produce the um, ammonium anion. So we have polar acidic uh, amino acids now. Uh, Aspartic acid, glutamic acid, histidine, lysine, and arginine. What these have in common uh, is that the uh, R groups uh, are either uh, carboxylate groups or uh, the uh, ammonium uh, groups. Here you see that here. So, learning check here. Let's identify each of the following as either a polar or a nonpolar amino acid. Uh, glycine here. 
Would you say this is a polar amino acid or a nonpolar one? Switch. It's nonpolar because the R group here, remember these two are always going to cancel the, uh, uh, each other out. So you have a hydrogen here for the R group, and that's uh, uh, nonpolar. Uh, what about here? Polar or nonpolar? Yes, that's polar because you have this hydroxyl group on three amino. So questions about uh, these classifications so far. Ooh. Amino acids are stereoisomers. You can see there are Fischer uh, uh, projections here. Remember that uh, here you have two uh, um, uh, stereoisomers. Uh, in this one, the Fischer projection has a hydroxyl group on the left. This one has it on the right. That makes that an L glyceraldehyde and this a D glyceraldehyde. And the same thing uh, applies uh, to these uh, alanine and cysteine, for instance. And as it happens in nature, in the biosphere, all of the amino acids that you find are the L enantiomers, not the uh, uh, D enantiomers. That's, uh, uh, again, uh, a feature of metabolism in which if there are possible pairs of enantiomers or groups of stereoisomers, generally speaking, only one of them is going to actually be used in the metabolism of uh, cells because evolution uh, is frugal. So I'll go on to talk about Zwitter ions. Uh, the text and uh, this PowerPoint uh, pays more attention to them than I'm uh, interested in, but I'll go through it anyway. Zwitter ion has an equal number of uh, ammonium and carboxylate groups. Uh, so alanine, for instance, has one ammonium group one carboxylate group, uh, so it has two charges on it, but uh, this is a, uh, a neutral, uh, nonpolar uh, amino acid. There's a, uh, there's a thing called a pi value for each amino acid, and it's unique for each amino acid. The pi value is defined as that pH at which the uh, 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 nonpolar and polar uh, amino acids uh, are uh, at neutral uh, charge. So there's only one pH at which any given amino acid is going to be is going to have a neutral charge. That pH at which the uh, negative and positive charges cancel each other out. So it's called the isoelectric point. The isoelectric point or the PI. That's the pH at which Zwitter ions have zero charge. Uh, the, the PI of nonpolar and polar neutral amino acids uh, range from pH 5.1 to 6.3. Uh, the most important thing about these isoelectric points is that uh, at the pH corresponding to the isoelectric point, the amino acid is least soluble in water. Why? It's uh, because it is essentially a neutral charge. It doesn't mean it's insoluble in water, but it means it has the least solubility uh, of uh, uh, any other pH. So solutions that are more acidic than the uh, isoelectric point have the carboxylate uh, in this litter ion accepting a proton and becoming neutral. That's what's happening here. So again, uh, if you have a pH that's more acidic uh, than the pi, the uh, <clears throat> A carboxylate is going to become neutral. 
and there's going to be a net positive charge on the amino acid. Uh, glycine uh, uh, with a, a PO6 has a negative one charge in solutions that have a pH above uh, 6.0 or more alkaline. So the uh, ammonium uh, part of this winter ion is going to lose a proton in solutions that are more basic than the uh, isoelectric point. And here are some examples of uh, the ionized forms of nonpolar and polar uh, neutral amino acids. Uh, polar acidic and polar basic amino acids also ionize the carboxylate and ammonium uh, portions of them. Uh, uh, so winter ions of, of polar uh, acidic amino acids ex exist at values that are quite acidic. Uh, Zwitter ions of polar basic amino acids exist at values that are quite uh, basic. Yes. So, are you saying that all Zwitter ions have an equal number of the amino acids? No, they, uh, how, however, uh, their R groups are arranged the, at the PI, at the isoelectric point, all of the charges are going to add up to zero. I think that's the easiest way to say it. Aspartic acid, polar acidic amino acid. Its PI is quite acidic. Uh, it forms a Zwitter ion, therefore, at the at pH 2.8, and it forms negative ions with negative charges at pH values greater than 2.8. In other words, aspartic acid is usually going to be uh, a uh, negatively charged ion at at most pHs, and certainly at uh, physiological pH. So here you see it. Here's this water ion at the um, at pH 2.8. It's sizing like this point. At pH 7, uh, it's going to uh, uh, have a, a, a charge of negative uh, 1. And uh, at a pH greater than 10, it's going to have a charge of negative 2. 1, 2. That should be a positive 1. Now, this uh, is important for those protein chemists who use electrophoresis to separate not only amino acids, and they do that by uh, modulating the pH that the electrophoresis is conducted at to give different charges, whatever charges they uh, require, to different amino acids. The proteins altogether have charges that are simply the sum of the charges of all, of all their amino acids at a particular pH. Everybody follow that logic? That means that proteins can also be separated by electrophoresis. In electrophoresis, you have uh, some gel that the amino acids or proteins can move through because the uh, fibers of the gel have holes uh, among them that form roots that the amino acids and proteins can follow. The amino acids and proteins are going to move uh, from one side of the gel to the other, or vice versa, according to what their charges are when an electric field is set up uh, across that uh, gel. So you put a it's usually an auto-dose gel or something similar to it. You put a gel uh, on the unit, just like that. This unit has a positively charged 
electrode on one end and a negatively charged electrode on another. In other words, there is a, uh, an electric current, an electric circuit running through this that includes the gel itself. Or in this paper, it's, in, in this case, it's a piece of paper uh, that can also serve as a function of the gel. If there is that electric current going on, then any amino acids or proteins that are charged with having either a negative or a positive charge are going to be attracted to whichever electrode has the opposite charge. Are going to follow that? So that's the principle of electrophoresis. Because the uh, amino acids and proteins are going to have different charges and or different sizes, because the larger these uh, molecules are, the slower they're going to creep through the uh, matrix of the paper or the gel. Because of that, it means that uh, each type of protein or amino acid is moving at a different rate uh, in this uh, electrophoretic setup. So that's a way of separating them or purifying them, if you will. Eventually, you're going to have bands of different amino acids that have moved at, 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 in a different direction and at a different rate from all of the others. Remember, the isometric point is unique to the point of the, each of the twin amino acids. So electrophoresis is going to give it long enough to separate either proteins from one another or amino acids from one another. So you'll get 20 different bands of amino acids at some point uh, after you uh, electrophoresis them. Or if you have a, a mixture of proteins, which is very often the case in protein chemistry, think of uh, collecting serum from an individual. That serum is a soup of uh, many different uh, proteins. If you put that serum uh, in, uh, on, in a band on the paper, or in the electrophoresis gel, if not those gels, there are actually little wells in the uh, gel that you fill up uh, with the serum. If you do that, then you're going to, after you perform the electrophoresis, you'll have a whole uh, spectrum of protein with each particular protein, or clotting factor, eight clotting factor, nine, albumin, whatever, they're going to be separated. They're going to be on, at different points along the gel or the uh, paper. So that's the idea of uh, electrophoresis. You can take what's often a mixture of proteins or amino acids, and you can resolve them into their individual uh, uh, types. And not only have you separated them from the other uh, parts of the soup, but you purify them. You now have a pure preparation of factor IX and factor VIII or uh, albumin. So in protein chemistry, uh, uh, it's uh, important uh, to uh, use electrophoresis. The proteins are usually, or many of the proteins, are globular. They're not, uh, so their size is, at, is, if you will, their size differences are hidden by, by the fact that many of them are bunched up into balls. And so the idea in doing this is that you first uh, reduce the uh, disulfide bridges that are responsible for much of the globular uh, structure of them. That leaves the proteins more or less strings of amino acids uh, that differ mainly in their size, as it were. So that uh, they get uh, better separated if you uh, use a strong reducing agent to uh, do that, to denature the proteins, as it's called. Now, some of the amino acids are essential, meaning you have to get them in your diet because uh, your body is not uh, making them uh, de novo. Histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine. You can see there's a long list of them. And uh, the uh, consequence of that can be 
that if you're a strict vegetarian, then you may not be getting some of these amino acids in your diet. Uh, your valine is, uh, yeah, uh, valine is uh, one of them. But you have to be careful uh, what vegetables you eat to include vegetables that contain valine, for instance. The uh, uh, custom in many areas of combining legumes, beans, for instance, uh, with something like corn, which has, I believe, uh, alanine on it, I can't remember what that is. But uh, the combination of those two, uh, uh, they're, they are complementary as far as their amino acid composition goes. The amino acid that one of them lacks is present in the other one, and vice versa. So there can be amino acid deficiencies because uh, so many of, of them are essential. So uh, here are some selectable, uh, selected uh, vegetables and uh, grains. Eggs, milk, meat, fish, poultry have uh, basically all of the essential amino acids in them. None of them are deficient in it, or few uh, at any rate. Rice, wheat, and oats uh, lack lysine and tryptophan. Corn lacks methionine and tryptophan. Beans uh, lack uh, corn lacks lysine and tryptophan. Beans lack methionine and tryptophan. Peas lack methionine. Uh, almonds and walnuts uh, lysine and tryptophan, and uh, so on. So again, di uh, you have to watch your diet uh, if you're a strict vegetarian. So we'll talk about the formation of the peptide bond uh, next. Right here. The peptide bond is an amide bond. So here we have it. As you see, it's an amide functional group uh, between two amino acids, basically. A peptide bond forms between the carboxyl group of one amino acid and the amino group of the next one. So here we have a carboxyl group glycine and an amino group of alanine, and if you react them together, uh, you'll have, and notice it's a, guess what, a, a synthesis reaction, and the bond, the peptide bond, is forming between, the, again, this carboxyl group and this amino group, and of course we have brought together then uh, two amino acids. So there's a free uh, uh, ammonium terminal written on the left, uh, a free uh, carboxylate terminal written on the right. So here's the ammonium terminal on the left and the carboxylate terminal on the right. Why isn't it the other way around? It could be, but arbitrarily or by convention, when we write amino acid sequences, we start on the left with that amino acid at the end of the uh, uh, polypeptide that uh, has a free ammonium uh, group. This one does not. This one instead has a free carboxylate group. So it's the one that is written on the right. In vivo, this is uh, all happening on the ribosome. We're going to find that the uh, ribosome is a little organelle uh, in uh, uh, all living things, and that when the sequence of DNA is translated, as you see, into amino acid sequence, the uh, uh, peptide bonds formed between the amino acids in the chain are formed by, in fact, a, a um, residue of uh, ribonucleic acid that's part of the ribosome. So that's, this is a case, a very important one, of where the uh, uh, RNA in the ribosome, a relic of the RNA world, you could say, is catalyzing a very important uh, chemical reaction here. So here you have it in uh, ball and stick models. There's a car, uh, carboxylate group, the ammonium group, is going to form between them this uh, peptide bond, 
and the uh, uh, peptide bond, again, is simply an amide group between the two amino acids. Again, there's a water form because it's a, a, synth a synthesis reaction, a condensation reaction. So the result here is known as a dipeptide. It's got two amino acids in it that makes it a, a dipeptide. A tripeptide would have three amino acids in the chain. And generally, uh, if you have many amino acids uh, chained together like this, it's called a polypeptide. There are terms like oligopeptides as well, but they're not really So, to name the uh, dipeptide, you have an ill ending the uh, amino acids name at the end terminal and the full amino acid name of the three carboxyl group uh, at the uh, C terminal end. So, this side of the dipeptide is known as the end terminal, and for the uh, ammonium, or uh, yeah, the ammonium. And this end of the dipeptide is called the C-terminal, C for carboxylate group. And it doesn't matter if you have a thousand amino acids strung together. There's going to be an amino end or an N-terminal and a, carboxyl, uh, a carboxyl end or a C-terminal. And in the case of this, you're going to call this alanyl from alanine, glycyl from uh, glycine, and on this it's going to be simply serine, the amino acid name. Everybody follow that? So here's the SOP for it. Draw the structures for each amino acid in the peptide, starting with the M terminal uh, on the left. Remove the O atom from the carboxylate group of the uh, N, uh, 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 N terminal amino acid and two hydrogen atoms from the adjacent amino acid. You repeat the process until the C terminal amino acid is reached. You connect the remaining parts by forming those amide or peptide bonds. So I'll let you uh, practice this at home. Again, we have a serine here and a threonine here, so this dipeptide would be called. Serial creamine. I'll uh, again let you practice uh, this at home. It's kind of trivial. And this one too. But if you practice this at home, you'll convince yourself that, the, that there is a certain number of possible combinations of uh, uh, any uh, amino acids. So, the three-letter abbreviation and name for the following tetrapeptide, I'm not going to ask you to associate the structures with the names of these uh, amino acids. That's a little bit uh, uh, thorough for uh, this uh, canvas. Uh, here. At any rate, uh, how would you name the... Uh, um, Tetrapeptide altogether. First of all, how would you uh, uh, indicate that in the name? This is alanine, and the corresponding name in the tetrapeptide would be alanyl. This is leucine, so the corresponding name in the tetrapeptide would be leucil. Cysteine, cystil. And finally, this is methionine, and you're just going to call it methionine. Oops, I don't know if that hurt. Yes, alanyl, leucyl, cystyl, uh, methionine. Again, you can you can play that game for any number of amino acids. Yes. You should know the corresponding uh, three-letter or uh, uh, and one-letter code. Uh, well, you should be able, if you see it, you should be able to name it. If you see its structure, I'm not going to expect you. 
Right. It's the sort of thing they have wall posters. All right. Uh, now, since we're talking about the uh, uh, symbols, originally each of the 20 amino acids had a three letter uh, symbol for it. And that worked just fine until we started building databases of amino acid sequencing proteins that uh, were terabytes uh, long. At that point, uh, the algorithms of computers have a much easier time dealing with single letter codes for each amino acid rather than three letter codes. So if you go to the databases at NCBI and look at protein uh, polypeptide sequences, you're going to find uh, a number of uh, these single uh, letter codes rather than these triple letter codes. So actually, this, uh, these have become more or less obsolete. Uh, I think they can probably, uh, it's actually easier to recognize that his stands for histidine, arch for arginine, and so on. It's not so easy uh, to uh, recognize Q for glutamine, and so on. So the single letter codes are way uh, more uh, useful for the algorithms that align and analyze uh, protein uh, sequence. Uh, but these do have their uh, use uh, still. Now I'm getting to uh, primary structure of uh, proteins. I'm going to start out with the levels of protein structure because there are actually layers of uh, the uh, features of uh, protein structure. And then I'll start talking about each of the layers. Um, and before I do, let's go through the, uh, there are many functions of proteins. And I have to tell you that uh, there's some level of arbitrarity uh, in this table. Uh, for instance, uh, storage uh, proteins uh, here, uh, it's not in here actually. Uh, how about that? No. In uh, some of the textbooks, for instance, hemoglobin is uh, classified as a transport protein, which makes sense. Transports oxygen, doesn't it? But some text will tell you that myoglobin is also a transport protein. Well, actually, myoglobin doesn't transport oxygen uh, anywhere to speak of. Uh, it remains in the cell, and it's actually there to store oxygen. So it's actually a storage protein. So there's not consensus in uh, some of these uh, features. At any rate, there are certainly structural proteins that are understood as such. Keratin uh, is a, uh, a structural protein that helps form our hair and skin. Contractile proteins are very common. It's, it's muscles, smooth muscles and striated. Transport proteins, again, <coughs> uh, we've already talked about lipoproteins, for instance. We'll be talking about hemoglobin. Uh, they are indeed uh, have evolved to transport materials around the body. There are lots of storage proteins. Cassin stores protein in milk, ferritin, iron. Uh, there are storage proteins for copper and zinc, you name it. Hormonal proteins are uh, important. Uh, insulin, for instance, regulating the uh, blood uh, glucose level, is a relatively short protein. Uh, there are a lot of uh, shorter proteins called neuropeptides uh, that, and they include, uh, I believe oxytocin is here, isn't it? No, the growth hormone is. It's a neuropeptide. Oxytocin is pitocin. Uh, 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 there are lots of these uh, neuropeptides that uh, uh, function as hormones. Enzymes are a very large and important class of proteins and rate their own chapter, the one coming up. Uh, 
of course, they, uh, their function is to catalyze uh, chemical reactions that are required for metabolism to proceed, but that would uh, spontaneously happen at a very slow crawl. So enzymes are there to give those reactions a kickstart. Uh, protection is kind of a, uh, a weird thing. Immunoglobins, of course, are protecting us against foreign invaders and pathogens and uh, so on. So uh, they could be considered uh, uh, to functions of uh, protective uh, proteins. Uh, here's an example of those uh, neuropeptides. This is met in kethylene. It's an endothelin, which means it uh, uh, will bind to receptors on neurons in the central nervous system and mediate the mitigation or the lowering of uh, pain. Uh, as you see, it's a string of uh, uh, amino acids, <coughs> and there are, it's one of a whole family of uh, endorphins. And as we, as I s uh, spoke of in the last chapter, there are alkaloids that are actually mimicking the uh, function of these endorphins by binding to the same receptor. Opioid receptors. So here uh, is a long list of these uh, hormones. Uh, uh, I've already mentioned the nanotropin releasing hormone, for instance, and it's a, a, a peptide. Uh, Thyrotropin releasing hormone. Uh, uh, oxytocin here, insulin, somatostatin, etc. So, long list of hormones. Their uh, target tissues uh, are also uh, quite varied. Uh, one, ex uh, a, one example that has only recently been characterized is the uh, neuropepti uh, the peptide hormone leptin. Leptin, uh, uh, let's see. All right, so here you have a uh, rat that's normal in the leptin gene. And here you have a rat that has a mutant of the leptin gene. So as you might surmise, the function of the leptin gene is to keep a person slim rather than fat or obese. So they did a lot of uh, studies with the, uh, the mutant is called OB. In the case of a mutant, there's no leptin. And since leptin function is not there, there's a greater appetite in the organism, and the metabolism is slowed down. These are both wild type or normal, non-mutant uh, mice, uh, uh, rats. Excuse me. If you uh, if you diminish the amount of leptin in this normal sized uh, rat, you will end up with uh, an obese rat. Conversely, if you have the normal rat that's obese for whatever reason, and inject it with leptin, the uh, rat will have a normal uh, body uh, shape. Finally, uh, with this uh, mutant, then there's no leptin being formed, uh, being used, it's, or a, a, a mutant leptin, and so the uh, rat is going to end up obese. However, if you inject uh, leptin uh, into a mutant rat, you'll find that the uh, mutant rat will not uh, be obese. So altogether, these uh, uh, establish that leptin is required to have a normal body size, and without it, uh, the individual is unlikely to be obese. Well, of course, that, that really excited the people who uh, discovered this, as you can imagine. So what's going on here is that there's a gene for this uh, leptin called the OB gene. It produces a leptin protein uh, that uh, will get into the bloodstream and affect the hypothalamus. So that makes it a, 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 a an authentic uh, peptide hormone. The hypothalamus, uh, of course, uh, affects uh, behavior. 
through a number of other neuropeptide uh, hormones or other hormones. And the behavior effect is that the individual is no longer hungry and therefore will eat less. That keeps the individual uh, slim. If, however, there's a mutant OBG and no functional protein, leptin protein is uh, uh, secreted, then that's not going to happen in a hypothalamus. A hypothalamus is not going to tell the individual that he or she has had enough uh, to eat, and the individual is going to go on eating until he or she is obese. So generally that's how we uh, find uh, peptide hormones functioning, or any hormones. Now I'm going to talk about two general classes of protein structure. They're really general. The one is globular proteins. Those are proteins that, after they have been synthesized into a long polypeptide chain, the R groups of their amino acids will start interacting with each other, which usually means they'll start attracting each other from uh, because they have opposite chargers, or those hydrophobic ones are going to be are going to seek the core of the uh, uh, protein. At any rate, that's going to lead to a structure that is more or less, generally speaking, globular, like a sphere, a sphere. So that's the first of the two general uh, classifications. Globular proteins tend to be compact. Excuse me a minute. They are compact, they have spherical shapes, uh, and uh, many of the classes of uh, proteins, uh, functional classes, are uh, globular. Myoglobin, for example, stores and, uh, and transports food for, for, I think, exceptions in the slide. Uh, anyway, the other of the two is fibrous proteins. A fibrous protein is a very straightforward uh, definition. It's long and skinny, isn't it? It's a fiber. So there are lots of fibrous uh, proteins as, as well. Many of them are uh, structural. So again, they are long fiber-like shapes. Alpha keratins make up hair, wool, and skin, and nails. Uh, beta keratins uh, make feathers. Uh, and in fact, dinosaurs that evolved feathers had to uh, as it were, evolve a beta keratin. Uh, that's something that we don't have. And let's see. So here we have alpha keratin, part of our own uh, uh, hair and wool. Uh, I think I'm going to, this is a good time to stop, I think. I'll talk about the primary structure, which is one of the four levels of uh, protein structure. And I'll go through the other levels of it on Wednesday.